Apostle Jackie is ministering in Lexington, Kentucky this morning, and we cover her to be anointed in the fullness by which God wants to release everything that he has to release out of her. And we welcome you here today. We are going to worship. We are going to enter his gates with praise. We are going to love him unconditionally, unhindered, unhinged. Any, the Lord wants to come in and overwhelm us with his presence. And Father, we invite you right now into this place. We invite you into this house, into our personal house. We invite you into the atmosphere around City Gate Atlanta and the city of Atlanta and into this area. Father, we declare the goodness of who you are. We declare your majesty, your glory. We declare your authority. And we declare that everything bows to you. Yes. You are the sovereign Lord. You are the one true and living God. And everything is created for you, by you, and unto you. And we come in here this morning to give you all honor and glory, to give you our personal praise to corporately come together as one man, one weapon, to use in the atmosphere to wield for your glory so that those in this house and those outside this house are delivered in another measure and another measure and another measure until complete freedom comes. That is your heart. Father, I declare over the worship team and the worship team in the audience that we are Judah and we are going forth with praise unto you because there is no one like you. You, our God, you rule and reign and we submit to your authority and yet we know that you come into us in intimate ways so that we become like Jesus to where our feet walk. So as we bring all of ourself unto you this morning, we love you, we honor you. Father, we give you full reign in this house to have your way, to do as you please, to say the words that you need to say, to anoint the lips of us as we worship, to anoint the lips of Bradley as he releases the word, to anoint the worship to anoint the dancers, to anoint those that are coming and being drawn in even off of the road. Lord, we are calling those that are passing by that are hungry and thirsty and looking for answers, who have brokenness like we have, who have questions like we have, but yet they don't yet know you. Lord, we call them in. We send out a call yes. to them to come into the house of the Lord to find the true and living God. Come, 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 come into the house of the Lord to find the true lover of your soul, to find the true, true path of your life, to serve and love the most high God, the maker of you. Let us worship. Let us enter into his presence today. And every facet that happens in this house today, let us enter in fully into what the Father is saying to us. He's here to restore today. God says he's here to restore the things that you have lost. Some of you have lost your peace. Some of you have lost your joy. Some of you have lost your identity. But God says, I am here to restore what the enemy has stolen. There is so much that has been lost during this season. But I want you to imagine the things that you believe you have lost. Now, I want you to see the greatness of God. See the greatness of God as he stretches out his arms and covers you. And he says, 
You are my son. You are my son. And today I am going to restore unto you your joy, your peace. Some of you feel like you've lost your mind and you're not able to sleep. But God says, I'm going to restore your ability even to lie down and sleep. Now, I say these things because those were some things that the enemy stole from me. But I declare today that we are kings and we are priests. And that is so much more than we can imagine. God says, I call you kings because I am the king of kings. So you are my kings. And this revelation is going to go like a sonic boom today. It's going to be like a sonic boom when we hear the word that is preached today. Because God says, I am a God of restoration. So those of you who want to prepare your hearts, and if I may, Sandra, ask those who feel like they want to be restored in any areas to come forward. If you want to be restored, I'm already up here. <laughs> I'm here. God, I know that you are calling us to a season of divine reversals, which means everything that we've lost is going to be restored. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, we declare as your children, as your kings and your priests that you have prepared a coat of many colors for us. So Lord, as an act of faith, I want everybody, your coat of many colors is in your hand. And as you make a gesture, put on Put on your coat of many colors right now. In the name of Jesus, put on rest. Put on peace. Put on your identity this morning. God says, I am going to use you and you're going to walk in a way that others will say, what is there about him? What is her, what is there about her? There's something she's carrying. There's something she's wearing. There's something he's carrying. There's something he's wearing. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, we prepare our hearts for the message that's coming forth today. And we say by faith, we put on our coats of many colors. We put on that coat this morning. Whatever it is, if you need joy, put on joy. If you need peace, put on peace. If you need a financial breakthrough, put on the double portion that God says I have for you. He never runs out, never runs out. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now we want to thank him. So in advance, say thank you for restoring me. Thank you. Thank you for restoring me. Thank you by faith. I say thank you in advance for restoring us today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, you may return to your seats. God bless you. There is, a, there is a greater measure of knowing who you are in him in this house today. We, you know, I was a daddy's girl on earth, but I'm a daddy's girl in heaven. Come on. And you are too. You're a daddy's boy. You're a daddy's man. You're, you're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. And that intimacy 
whether you had it or not on earth, is still available out of your Heavenly Father. It is not the American dream. It is not the religious dream. It is the kingdom of God dream over your life that you step into who He made you be. If you just read the Gospels and you look at Jesus who stood against everything and did what His Father said because His Father was so intimate with him. That's where he's saying to us at City Gate and everybody listening, come in this morning. I I have something to say to you. I want you to know how much I love you. He loves us. He's saying to us this morning when you sing this song, open your hands wide tune yourself to heaven and let him pour that love out on you it is not american love i need for you to understand that it is a kingdom love for you as his child on this earth who is here to execute his name wherever he says we have to be so in love with him that we hear every breath he's taking as we move out. So this morning, I'm just inviting you back into the worship of this song. He, we are who he says we are. And if it's a struggle, and it is a struggle sometimes, when life is really ugly, and when things are swirling like they are, we feel unsure but this is our surety place right here this is our anchor who he says we are in him so nathaniel just take us back and let's just let's just enter into his presence in that right now right now the lord is birthing something new one of the interest, um, intercessor Beth was talking about that god wants to do an alpha there is something new and fresh that's coming right now on you. There is something new right now. Just receive it. I don't know the fullness of what he's doing, but right now he is birthing something new in you, and he's saying, receive it right now. There is a shifting in you. There's a crushing the things that used to hold you captive, the idols that you used to hold on to, knowingly or unknowingly. He is, he is, he is crushing them now. He is crushing them now. As Jeremiah was saying it, he's doing it right now. So receive the new birthing of the Lord. Receive the new anointing of the Lord. Receive the new deliverance and the new identity. He's saying right now, I need you to step, agree with me fully of who I say you are. Agree with me fully. No more debate me about who I say you are. You are my my kings and priests you are my chosen generation you are my the overcomers that i made you to be you are more than a conqueror you are the righteousness of god agree fully with me because i am stepping you into a new identity i am stepping you into a new vista of who i created you to be because i need you individually and corporately to move in who i say you are and come in full agreement so father today 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 we agree with you we agree with you lord a fresh anointing to move into who you say we are a fresh authority to do as the king and priest in this earth that you say we are the chosen generation today that you hear my voice don't harden your heart don't debate me no more come into all agreement you are victorious you are delivered you are healed you are set free receive it now receive it now receive it now right into where your 
our spirit man is sitting right now with the Father. We'll do the announcements and we will do offering after Bradley is through, so don't run out. If you gotta run out, run up here first. No, I'm just kidding. Um, the children have already been dismissed earlier because they have a full uh, curriculum today in the children's ministry. It's gonna be a lot of fun. But I um, just stay in the place of the Lord. Even in this house, we give our offerings all during the service. So if you have something you are blessed and want to agree with and sow into, you may do that. Uh, but we will take up an offering. If Nathaniel, if you can come back up afterwards so we can do announcements and offering. But Bradley White is a long-term long time, long term friend, <laughs> same thing, with Jackie, and um, we love you. The first time I met Bradley, he and Jackie were doing a joint Bible study somewhere up 85, and um, it was awesome, and I remember then, I said, I, I would, uh, it was too far to drive on Sunday, but I would do it after work, and it was just an awesome time. Uh, Bradley has a depth of understanding that you are going to be blessed by today as you sit and partake, as you, in the place that we're at with the Father in this house right now, enter in in that fullness because it's going to be awesome. Bradley, we bless you. We release you to say and minister as the Lord leads, and we just bless you as you come. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm really trying to get my act together up here. <clears throat> Made the mistake of almost blowing out my voice before I got a chance to actually use it like I needed to, but thank you. Uh, thanks to Apostle Jackie for, <clears throat> excuse me, allowing me to uh, share with you this morning, and um, well, I'm full. I, I don't know about you. Uh, kind of at the, one of those moments to where I don't really quite um, know exactly what to say, but so we'll just pray. How about that? Lord, I thank you that you have um, delivered us and marched us out of just doing uh, things the same old way that we've always done them because you're trying to get something accomplished in the earth. And Lord, we're so thankful that you, you actually let us be a part of it. It's amazing. It's amazing. Lord, I ask you to grant me a lot of grace here to unpack and just release what you put in my heart. We would all grow and come to a new place as we've already experienced this morning in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> Amen. I want to share with you uh, something that I've uh, entitled the divine right of kings. Uh, that's an expression that's used a lot in a particular way, and I want to um, show you that it's an expression that we ought to start using about ourselves. Um, in years of uh, pastoring and being involved in ministry, I've, I've always been concerned that, that people would understand and be able to come to a place as a body when we're joined together with one another at a particular moment, whatever the situation may be, uh, that we can be united and we can be a fearless front full of faith to be able to take on whatever the enemy may be bringing against us as a body of believers. 
Um, there's no room for fear in the kingdom of God. And you cannot fear, uh, which is very common with a lot of people, you cannot fear the unknown. And you cannot fear uh, the unknown of the spirit world that maybe you haven't experienced or you haven't touched or you don't really understand. I want to try to pull a lot of it, of it into an understanding today so that you could just build on the foundations of what Apostle Kevin Sambrook was sharing with us about the mission of Christ in the earth today and about what Apostle Jackie was sharing with us uh, over the last couple of weeks just about flowing in the Spirit, being one together with one another and understanding the power and the anointing and the authority that we actually carry. The enemy is on a mission, always has been and always will be to convince you that you are not who God says you are. Just like the prayer and the anointing that was coming out of Beverly this morning. You have to determine to believe who God says you are. Because the enemy works overtime using people, using circumstances, using your own mind that you just let wander sometimes. Uh, much more than... You should, I'll say that of myself, um, to try to convince you that you're not really who God says you are. And you don't really have the power of God in you. You really don't have the spirit of God in you, the same spirit that rose Christ from the dead. He's not really there. Of course, look at what you just did or look at what you just thought or look at what you just said. And so we're in this war. Um, I want to go back, as I did the last time I shared, and give you a little brief history related to um, what I want to present is basically an understanding of the mission of Christ in the earth and our part in it, and then how we actually do it. I know that's a lot. So pray for me to have some grace here to get this done. In the name of Jesus. Uh, as I've shared before, there's a real challenge that we have in the Western world because we don't think like ancient Eastern civilization thought. The civilization of people that wrote the Old Testament. You know, Moses being one of the primary ones who was educated uh, in an Egyptian system where God used him to understand what's really going on in the spirit world. And took him out into the wilderness and showed him all of the wilderness where he was going to be leading the people of God well before God actually called him to do it. So God is preparing us. But I want to help us shift our mindset. You cannot think like a good old Western thinker, which we've all been educated in and we've all been taught this way over and over again to where everything is just, you know, one fact after another fact after another fact. You start with this point, the obvious conclusion is this. Why? Because it's a straight line of thought. Because it just is. And that's the way that we've been taught in Western culture when the reality of it is the Bible is not written in that type of way and thought process. And... God does not function. He wasn't educated in the American public school system. You know? And we were. So we got an issue. And so Easter, Eastern mindset is very different. It's more conceptual. It's more theoretical. It's more vision, seeing things in this world and the other world. Otherworldly types of things. And seeing how they all work together with one another. And it's more of a circular type thinking to where you get a, a thought as presented in the word of God. And then the word just continues to build more and more of a circular pattern of thinking. It's like it's never ending. I mean, haven't you ever wondered why it is you can read the same verse you've been reading for 20 years, 30 years. And you're still getting revelation out of it. 
It's because that's how God is. The depth of it is just eternal. In Western thinking, we just want to fax, you know, what do I do? Do this, do this, do this, and this will be the result. Yep. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't work like that in the kingdom of God. And God is trying to shift us in the way that we think so that we'll quit putting him in a box and we'll allow him to be able to move freely in us individually and among us all together to be able to accomplish his purposes. Because his purposes are not understood like that. And the reality is, as I've learned through the years, a lot of times you just have to step out there and, you know, boom, you just go. You, you cannot stop and think about everything and rationalize everything and make it a logical progression in your thought process. Or you'll be standing still and waiting on the Lord to do things, which we're going to look at in a minute. And you'll still be sitting there. We don't want to sit there. We want to accomplish the purposes of God in the earth. We know the story of the beginning. Man was created. And man was created and given a mandate. Take dominion. Dominion's not going to just come to you. You take it. Yes. Take dominion over the earth. Rule over all of it. The purpose was is that God along with the sons of God and the angels and all the other divine creatures that he had created in heaven, had made their home in Eden on the earth in order to commission man to get his job done. Hopefully you're following me. So man was commissioned. Your realm is the earth realm. That's what you were created for. None of the... Divine creatures were given authority in the earth realm. You've got to understand that. That's not their place. If they go into that place, which we're going to see in a little bit, it's illegal in the spirit. And God will make, make them pay for it in the long run. Usually using us, which is the fun part of all of this. Of course, we know how <clears throat> man fell. The law of sin and death came in the earth. It affected mankind. It affected all of creation. Um, it affected his whole concept of being able to take dominion in the earth. It became harder because you're working against the curse. You got all of these things against you behind which all of them are, um, we'll just call dark entities that are ruling in the heavens trying to get themselves into position in the earth to keep man from doing what God created him to do. Over 1,600 years or so passed from the time of the fall of man to the time that we come to uh, Genesis chapter 6 where the Bible talks about the sons of God who were these divine beings, uh, had relations with the daughters of men and they produced this new race, so to speak, upon the earth called the Nephilim, the giants. Now, this is in the Bible. You just need to go back and read Genesis chapter 6. Some of you, I don't want you to look at me like I just flew in from another planet this morning. But this holds the key to us understanding our role of taking dominion in the earth and who we are fighting against. The 600, 1,600 years or so between the fall of man um, in Genesis chapter 6, just a few chapters in the Bible, many, many years, families began to reproduce all throughout the earth. Human population was rather large. And it was during this time, Genesis chapter 6 tells us that the sons of God took the daughters of men and began to have relations with them Actually, it was more than that. They began to influence them, mankind. They began to teach mankind, especially in the ways of the occult. Divina we call it today. Divination, uh, 
different things of that nature, which are all related to, uh, if you can see it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They taught the daughters of men who then taught their children and then continued generationally how to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was forbidden for man to eat of. He could eat of the tree of life, which was Jesus, all he wanted, but not partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In producing this new seed upon the earth, going along with God's judgment at the beginning, that there would be a war against the seed of the woman, Eve, the righteous seed, and the seed of darkness. That there's going to be a battle. Ongoing. So we see this war of seed, the seeds developing. And this is the history of the Old Testament. This is our history that we're dealing with today. The Bible says very clearly that these sons of God who took the daughters of men, they basically violated their God-given place of rulership, which was in the heavenlies, not on the earth. That was their great sin. They violated their boundary of existence. God didn't create them for that purpose. He created them for another purpose. So they violated that dominions or domains, so to speak, and they entered into the earth realm where man is supposed to be taking dominion. Instead, man gave in to their dominion. And so we have the progression you know, of the seeds of darkness being transmitted, so to speak, you know, from Adam down through the bloodline of all of mankind, enhanced and made even worse you know, with these Nephilim, which were the giants, which were part human and part uh, divine in their creation uh, to be able to be inhabiting the earth. And civilization was being built that way. Of course, we know that God looked down on it, saw that there was all kinds of chaos and things were completely and totally out of order. And so he decided that we needed a change. And so he found Noah, through which he was going to preserve the seed of righteousness. And so Noah built the ark. We all know the story. The flood came. The flood cleansed the earth of all of supposedly the, the bad seed. Then after the flood, we have several hundreds of years that take place. And then we come to this thing called the Tower of Babel. Nimrod, Nimrod was the leader of civilization, so to speak, during that time. He was responsible for building cities, those kinds of things. And so he got people together and they built this thing we call the Tower of Babel. It was actually a, what's called a ziggurat, which is a circular pattern. You know, it looks like a glorified wedding cake. You know, you got the big one on the bottom and then the next ring and then the next one, you know. And this was built... And they, it took a long time for them to build it. And they all joined together. And this is all of humanity that was on the earth at the time was joining together to build this. And it was for the purpose of reaching into a domain that man was not given authority to be in. That was their sin. On top of that, man was not doing what he was created to do, which was take dominion of the earth. They were huddled together in cities. Just doing whatever it is that their sinful flesh wanted to do. They were worshiping other gods. So I think you can see the progression of how things begin to develop in the earth. God moved in. He confused their language. He scattered the people. And then we have over in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Moses. This is hundreds of years later. Oh, keep up with me now. Moses is explaining to the children of Israel. Basically, God's plan in the earth and what's going on and what their purpose is. And he says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, 
when he divided mankind. Now, when did he divide mankind? At the Tower of Babel. That was the judgment of God. Confused their language, and then divided them up, and they spread out. Seventy nations formed all over the earth. What happened was, too, is that God gave the rulership of all of those nations to the corrupt sons of God. God gave all of mankind over. You want to worship other gods? Fine. You go worship other gods. Last part of the verse. He fixed the border of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Those are the corrupt sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted heritage. In other words, after the Tower of Babel, God gave all the nations over to the rule of the corrupt sons. That was his judgment against the people. And he started again with redeeming humanity by entering into a blood covenant with a new people that did not even yet exist. In Genesis 10 and 11. So we got a, we got a plan from God that's going on here. Question for you. Are, are you guys with me here? I, mean, am I, I, I want to make sense. I don't want to just kind of preach a good message. I'm, I'm over all that. I just I want to make sense. I want to help you understand because we're going we're going somewhere with this, as far as our purpose is concerned, especially. So then we come to Genesis chapter twelve, where God cuts the covenant with Abraham, and all of the nations He says shall be blessed through your seed. The seed Galatians tells us is actually Christ. That's why it is that we, when we get born again, or any human needs to be in Christ because the covenant's between the Father and the Son, between Christ and the Father. And the reason that we saw for that is because God represents, as the family representative in the covenant ceremony, God represents Himself. Yahweh in human form, which was Jesus, the one that shows up in human form, Yahweh in human form all through the Old Testament. We're talking about Jesus here. Melchizedek, all of those things. That's Jesus. And he represented mankind. Abraham was the witness to it all taking place. He prepared it all. That was his part. God performed it. Made the promises to Abraham. That through you, all of the nations, not just a chosen people... All of the nations. What was he referencing? He's referencing all of those 70 nations that he had passed judgment against. That enslaved all of their people with worshiping false gods. All of the nations of the earth shall be blessed through you and through your seed. So then we have the war of the seeds. This is exemplified down through time. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And then we have the 12 patriarchs of the children of Israel and we have the wars of the children of Israel and you know their responsibility to go in and destroy all of these ites and and these giants you know there's still the giants are still all intermingled in here why is that because there's the war of the seeds it's the seed of darkness against the seed of light this is the history of God in the earth because what he's after he's he's after man fulfilling his predetermined destiny and role on the planet, which is to take dominion over it and to rule and reign over it. And so we see that how God just positions the children of Israel. He gives them a land. It's declared a holy land. In other words, everybody else off the land. This land's holy. If you're not holy, you were holy because of the covenant. If you're not holy... You cannot be on this land. This land is for the people that are chosen of God. The covenant people of God. Those are the chosen people. The people that are in covenant with God. Those are the chosen people. So that's who God began to use. And of course we know all the stories of the wars and the kings that were raised up. And those that were good and those that were bad. The division of the kingdom. And all those different types of things that take place. And. We come to David, King David. David is actually building at one particular point 
this thing that we call the tabernacle of David. Now, uh, Lord, help me with this. In Amos, the Bible talks about the restoration of the tabernacle of David. God made a promise to David that of his descendants that there would always be one who would sit upon the throne. Now, we've taken that to mean all kinds of things today, and I don't want to chase any of those rabbits. What we need to understand, where was the throne? If that's where the seed was going to sit, then the descendant, where is the throne? And so David, just out of his love for God, he builds this tent in his backyard. His backyard just happened to be known as Mount Zion. And so he builds this tent. It's probably about as big as this middle section right here. Maybe not quite that big. And in the tent, he places the uh, Ark of the Covenant. The presence of God. On Mount Gibeah, several miles away, they have the tent, the t temple, so to speak, uh, in tent form, tabernacle, that's built. And they're offering up the blood sacrifices according to the old covenant system over there. But David had a tabernacle. Here's the amazing thing. David raised up skilled musicians, turned them loose to begin 24-7 prayer, praise, and worship in his tabernacle. Do you know that those people did not even offer up blood sacrifices to be able to come and go and to interface with the presence of God? This is old covenant. David didn't. Why? Because David got the revelation, Psalm 22, that the Lamb of God had been slain before the foundation of the world. He knew that his sins had already been paid for. The sins of the nation had already been paid for. So the call went out from the king. Whoever wants to worship the Lord, come here. Others, and we can see this today, that are more comfortable with the structured setting that just guarantees it's going to be a certain way. Y'all go over here in Mount Gibeah. You're still going to experience the presence of God. The blessing of God is still going to be on you. But you're going to miss the place that God is setting up in the earth for a purpose, for a reason. So we have this tabernacle of David. <clears throat> Of all the Psalms that were written, there's only two that were written by Moses. The rest of them were written by David, Asaph, Korah, and several others. And there's other Psalms that exist, I'm sure. The reality of it is we have all that we need. All of them, you must understand, were written out of the tabernacle of David. In New Covenant Revelation. So they give us a pattern of how we as the new covenant people of God are supposed to operate in the earth. Why do I say that? Well, what David would do as this praise and worship and prayer was going on in the tabernacle, David would gather his mighty men and they would come. They would sit in the tabernacle together. These mighty men of war and David. And they would worship the Lord and they would seek God and God would begin to release the new song of the Lord. And it would come through David sometimes. And it would come through Asaph sometimes. And they would begin to sing it in conjunction with the instruments that were being played. Many of which David invented himself. And taught people how to play them. And it was out of that place where David was with those mighty men. In the presence of God. God began to release that new song. And it would be songs that we've read in the Psalms. That goes something like this. Break their back. <laughs> Cut their tongues out. <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera. You get the point. <laughs> what was happening? The Lord was giving him instructions as the king for all of his army. This is what you need to do on the battlefield. This is how you're going to win your next battle. They would come in, sit Wait on the Lord. The Lord would speak. They would get the song. David would share the song. All the mighty men, they would join in together. Then they would leave 
with the army and go. And guess what happened? Those prayer warriors stayed behind in the tabernacle of David. And what were they doing? They were singing the psalm over and over again. While David went out with the mighty men and conquered the enemy. Exactly like what the psalm said. This is what the tabernacle of David was doing. What it's for. You know that David had 30 years. The Bible says 30 years of peace in his kingdom. After he took only two or three years being in the tabernacle, receiving from the Lord, knowing what to do, went out and conquered the kingdom, and the tabernacle of David continued guarding the peace of the kingdom. And I hope you're seeing a picture here of what it is that the Lord is doing with us, even his people. While David was um, in the tabernacle at one point, he got a real revelation from the Lord. Psalm chapter 110. 110. Psalm 110 is a very important scripture. You should um, read it many, many times. It is this scripture that is used the most of any other scripture of the Old Testament by the apostles in the New Testament. So you have to ask yourself why. And hopefully we can see. David says, The Lord says to my Lord, this is the revelation he's getting. I'll rephrase it. <clears throat> the Father says to my Lord, the Son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. So here it is. What is David seeing? He's seeing the resurrection of Christ. When Jesus was exalted, seated at the right hand of the Father, and this is what the Father says to the Son. Sit here on this throne, rule and reign. Until. Until is a time word. He's not getting up, going anywhere, coming back or anything. Until. All of his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. And then he tells you how he's going to do it. He says how he's going to do it. He says, stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. So what, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of things. The word scepter does literally mean a sword, as we would think. But in this instance, translated in Psalm 110, it literally means tribe. Tribe. In other words, the directions from the Father to the Son, this is how you're going to put all your enemies under your feet. Stretch forth from Zion, which is where the presence of God is. We are Zion. We are on Mount Zion. We're, it's all of those. Stretch forth from Zion your strong scepter. And then he says what? Rule in the midst of your enemies. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. So let me back up. Let me, I'll jump ahead all the way to the end and then I'll come back and, and redo it again. This is what Jesus is saying to us all the time. You know, I'm seated on my throne and I'm sitting here until all of my enemies and your enemies, my enemies are your enemies, are made a footstool for your feet. So I'm stretching forth my city gate tribe. Yes. And I'm saying to you, rule in the midst of your enemies. So when are we ever in the midst of our enemies? All the time. 24-7. That's why the tabernacle of David was filled with praise and worship and prayer 24-7. That's why the IHOP ministry that many of you are familiar with, that's why they do, the, do this thing 
on and on and on and on. There's, there's no way you can praise God too much and glorify God too much. It just doesn't exist. Let me jump ahead to the time of Jesus. Just basically say that we know that he was conceived of God, born of a man. He's the son of God, he's the son of man. He was the representative of mankind. That's why he had to be born a man. The representative of mankind in the Abrahamic covenant back in Genesis chapter 12. Even though it was already the plan of God and he was slain before the foundations of the world. And now this is Eastern thinking. If you are in your Western mentality trying to put all of those things together and make them make sense, you might as well forget it. I have an engineering background in education. If I can make this leap, you can do it. I just want to encourage you, you can do it. It might take you some time, but you can do it. Trust me. Christ was crucified. He was resurrected. He was exalted to be the king, as we saw in Psalm 110. There's other scriptures in the New Testament that specifically lay out more of an understanding of what Jesus' mission is in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, God raised him from the dead, seated him, Christ, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named. What is that? Rule and authority and power and dominion are the principalities, powers, spirits of wickedness in the heavenly places. They are the named corrupt sons of God that God judged. After the Tower of Babel and said, you take all the people and set up your own nation. Christ, as the Son of God, has been raised up to be above every one of them. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. All things are subject to his feet. This is what's said of man. This is the commission that was given to man from the beginning. You have dominion. Take it. Rule. In the earth. And he gave him his head over all things to the church. He's our great tribal leader. (laughs) Which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all things in all places. Is literally what that should be translated. Colossians chapter 1 says, Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things, all things have been created by him and for him. The wisdom of God. God uses all things. I mean, God uses every aspect of darkness to make them turn on themselves and destroy themselves. It's amazing. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself, so that, in other words, all of these things are true, so that Jesus might come to have first place in everything. So that Jesus might be, as the Son of Man, the ruler of the planet with all men. Sons of God. So that he would come to have first place in everything. Let me tell you. People say this all the time. You know, the the devil does not play fair. Well, he doesn't. But God does. The problem is, our definition of fair is what's wrong. See, the bottom line is this. Christ has already paid the price For the planet, the earth, and all of those that are in it. He's already paid the price. Everything that's going on related to the kingdom of darkness is illegal in the spirit. It's illegal in the spirit. We're the ones that traffic in the legal side of the spirit. If you can allow me to say it that way. Reality is Christ is king. He's exalted to be king. It's not... For something that's in the future. 
We're not waiting on Jesus to come back and sit on a throne somewhere. He's already on it. He's already been exalted to the right hand of the Father. And I'll show you that, show you that in just a minute. That that is the place of the throne. The new throne of God, so to speak. Matthew chapter 28. Jesus said, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go into all the world, etc. Notice what he said. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, it's authority. It's not power. We'll deal with that power in a different thing. It's all authority. In other words, the spiritually legal rightful place. You're on the right side when you're understanding the authority of God. All authority has been given me in heaven and on the earth. Why? Because he was the son of God ruling from heaven and over the heavens. He's the son of man ruling the earth. Now here's the flip side of it. When we get born again, we are then sons of God. He sons and she sons, if you follow what I'm saying. We're all sons of God, okay? We're still sons of man. That's why we have authority in Christ, in the heavens, and the earth. The reality is what goes on in the heavens is what's affecting what's on the earth. So we have to be able to take care of both of them. See, when God gave the mandate to Adam... There was not all of the spiritual darkness confusion that there is now. It was before the fall. That's why he had the authority to be able to just rule the earth. That's all he needed to do. Now it's changed. Christ has been exalted as king over all of the little K kings, us. He's the son of God, the son of man. We are the son of man. All of us are. We're the son of God because God put his spirit in us to make us sons. Birthed us into his kingdom and his government. As sons. Which thank you, Beverly, for that word of knowing who we are in Christ this morning. That was, wasn't that wonderful? Glory to God. The mission of Jesus is to take dominion of all the nations. Restoring all of the earth... To the state of his original earthly heavenly home. Which was Eden. That's the purpose of God. That's the mission of Jesus. The mission of Jesus is not to get everybody born again. That's part of it. You got to be born again to just see what's going on. The Bible says. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Baptized in water. You need to grow in God. To be able to walk in the reality of the kingdom government of Christ on the earth. So the mission of Jesus is not just so that the world, as we think in religious America, can be born again. Or people say saved. That's total misuse of the word. But that's not the mission. It's just part of it. The mission of Christ is to rule as king. Over all of his little K kings. And together they are to dispossess all of the corrupt sons of God. Principalities, powers that are ruling all the nations of the earth. In order to restore the earth to the way that God originally intended it to be and to operate. In the Garden of Eden. Sound far fetched? Uh, well it probably does to some people. It sounded far-fetched to me for several years, and then I finally saw it. And it changed everything. And I realized I was not just here to get blessed. <laughs> There's a bigger purpose. God has a lot more. There's a lot more than just getting blessed. Lord, get me off of that, and we'll go to another place. <clears throat> so what is our part? Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Follow along with me. This is Jesus. He's got his disciples together. He's already breathed on them the Holy Spirit. This is after he's been resurrected. He's breathed on them the Holy Spirit. He's 
you know, spend some time with them. And basically, he's giving them a uh, commission here. He says, Behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. You are to stay in the city. Some translations say wait. Some translations say tarry. It's the Greek word kathizo. It doesn't mean wait, and it doesn't mean tarry, and it doesn't mean stay. If there's anything that would describe the downfall of the church at large, we'll just put everybody in it, is that they have this mentality, they're always waiting on God. They're always waiting on God. Well, I'm waiting on the Lord. Did they? No. No, you're not. God's waiting on you. <laughs> He's waiting on you. So this, this word, kathizo, is a very interesting word in the Greek. And this is what it means. If you'll just imagine with me for a moment that this chair, which we all know the history and everything around it, um, kind of intimidated to sit down in it, actually. But um, this is a throne. Just imagine that this is a throne. We're seated in a line of thrones. And in the center is Jesus on his throne. Just think with me in the spirit, okay? This word kathizo means this. It means to sit comfortably on the throne like you're supposed to be there. Knowing that you are to rule and reign from it. That's what that word means. It doesn't mean stay like what we think stay means. So what was happening with these disciples on that period of time, those days that they were all gathered together in the upper room. They were learning. They weren't just hobnobbing and eating food and drinking wine and carrying on. No. They were learning to sit comfortably on the throne. Jesus said, stay. Stay there until I send the promise of the Father. So how long were they supposed to sit on the throne? Learn to sit on the throne. Until the promise of the Father came. Sit comfortably on the throne with the sense of belonging there for the purpose of exercising rule and authority and government. This is what Jesus told his disciples. This is what he's telling us. How do I know? Acts chapter 2. Fast forward a few days in the life of the disciples as they're gathered together in the upper room. They're learning to sit on the throne. You know, it's an amazing thing to me when you really think about it. Here's Jesus in Jerusalem. And we know that Jerusalem is absolutely filled with devils. Demonic powers. Spirits of wickedness. The list goes on and on. And yet, Jesus was resurrected from the dead. We know that the Bible says that he, you know, paralyzed, destroyed the works of the enemy, destroyed, you know, the enemy himself, took his authority away from him, basically. And yet, the stronghold over Jerusalem is still in place. You ever thought about that? That's amazing, isn't it? The stronghold over Jerusalem. Why in the world didn't Jesus take care of it? Because he wanted his disciples to learn to sit comfortably on the throne until he sent to them the power of God so that they could take care of it. So that they could start ruling and reigning. And so this is what happened. <clears throat> they learned to sit comfortably on the throne. And we pick it up in Acts chapter 2. We know that the power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God began to fall on his disciples and they came out front. We know the whole story. Let me jump into the middle of it. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you, 
regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried in his tomb is with us to this day. As because he was a prophet, David was a prophet, and he knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. God made a promise to David that one of your descendants would sit upon the throne. David, being a prophet, looked forward and saw who that was that was going to sit on his throne. It was Jesus. So we're talking about the resurrection here. It says it. He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor his flesh suffered decay. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses, therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. So we just think that, well, let me back up. What did the Father pour forth? Okay, it says he poured forth something. We just think it's the promise of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just the promise of the Holy Spirit or our understanding of what the promise of the Holy Spirit was. Take a step back. This is what was going on. As the disciples were learning to sit comfortably on the throne, basically what was happening is they were, I'm sure, worshiping, praising God, because that's how you get there. And in the midst of that, it opened up the heavens through the forces of darkness over the city of Jerusalem. God was able to, at that point, through Christ, God was able to pour out on Christ the coronation anointing oil to be the king. Jesus took that same coronation anointing oil and poured it out on the disciples through the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Granted them the power of God. Knighted them, so to speak, with the divine right of kings to rule and reign in this life. See, the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not just something that we just get because we're more spiritual or because we, you know, can express it better or, you know, it's kind of the thing to do or anything like that. It's not just so that you could have power in operating gifts and healings and miracles and all those kinds of things. No, it is the coronation anointing oil from heaven that says that you are a king. And you have the divine right before God Almighty, which means before everything and everybody else, to rule and reign in this life as kings. Which is what the Bible tells us over and over again. Let's look at this a little bit further. Psalm chapter 110, we'll just pick up reading. It's just right there at the end of uh, Acts 2. Let me... No, I'll just go to Psalm 110. We've read the first two verses of Psalm 110. Here's the rest of it. Your people will be a free will offering in the day of your power. That literally means in the day of your army. So when is the day of the army of the Lord? It's every day. It's every day. Every day since he poured out on the day of Pentecost. That divine commissioning, so to speak. He said, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, you go. It's not up for debate. You know, where are the questions? I mean, this, this is how God deals with me. You know, I'll say, yeah, but God, you know, I don't really understand that. He said, you he said go. Do. Do what you're created to do. Do what you're supposed to do. Do what I show you to do. And you'll grow into it. Let's keep reading. Your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. So this is what Jesus is doing at the right hand of the Father. Okay? This is the revelation that David had of, the, of Jesus being crowned as the king of all the heavens and the earth. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. 
So I ask you, when is the day of the wrath of the Lord? It's every day. The Bible says in Psalms, God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, I know God loves everybody and all that. I understand that. But just give me a moment here. We're talking about dealing with and dispossessing those that are influencing and those that are in the spirit that are illegally here. That are trying to take our planet from us. It doesn't belong to them. It only belongs to us as the people of God. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. He will judge among the nations. He's doing it all the time. Just read the headlines of the news. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter the chief men over a broad country. He will drink of the cup of God's wrath from the torrent flow by the way of treading. So therefore he will be lifted up in his headship over all. In other words, it's as the wrath of God is poured out against wickedness, wicked spirits... And those that have sold themselves out to the wickedness, when God knows their heart's not going to change, sad to say, but it, they are in the judgment. They are under the wrath. And it comes. If it doesn't break them so that they'll repent, they have to pay the price. It's the way that it works in the spirit. The reality of it is, is Christ is ruling in this way. We are ruling together in this way. And the Bible says right there in Psalm 110 verse 7, that as... Christ is walking through, releasing the wrath of God and the judgment of God in order to bring things in order on the planet. You know, it, it talks about, you know, basically it's his place to be. It's the place of his fulfillment. And I submit to you that it's the place of our fulfillment too. If you understand it. Psalm 149 is another scripture. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Let me back up. High praises. Let the high praises of God. You know that word high praises? That's the only place in the whole Bible that that Hebrew word is used. So you have to ask yourself the question, what the heck is that about? (laughs) You know, what is that? If it's the only place that that is specifically used, high places... Praises, which take you to high places, that's your song. (laughs) Let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. What's a two-edged sword? Literally, in the Hebrew, this word means many-mouthed sword. Many-mouthed sword. So we've got praises that are... The highest of praises, wherever and whatever that is, that will bring forth a many-mouthed sword for a purpose, to execute vengeance in the nations, punishment on the people, to bind their kings with chains, their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written, to execute on them the judgment written, to execute on them the judgment written. What is the judgment written? Well, it's right here in the Word, and it's written in the books of heaven that are released through your mouth by making decrees. That's where this whole decree thing, declaration thing comes from. It's the judgment written. This is an honor for his godly ones. This is an honor. See, we, we're still growing in our understanding of what it really means to be a king ruling and reigning with Christ. And really understanding what we're up against. The war between the seed of darkness and the seed of light. And sure, we're supposed to go after every single person that we can rip out of the kingdom of darkness. We need as many of them as we can get. I'm telling you. But we need to disciple them and we need to train them. We need to work together with them. And we all need to participate in being able to do that. So that we can all come to the place to where we know what our seat is. We know what our seat is. Where it is that you rule and reign. With Christ. You have one individually. I'm convinced we have one corporately. This is an honor for his godly ones. Praise the Lord. 
All right, let me start landing this thing. So I want to make it practical. I've kind of hit several different topics. I want to try to pull it all together. You hear a lot come from up here on the stage, this concept of sound that came out this morning. The sound of the Lord, the sound of the Lord, the new song, the Bible calls it, the new song of the Lord. Well, what in the world is that all about? Well, without trying to explain all of it, and hopefully you can just get it and go do your own research. In the very beginning, when God said, light be, the Bible says light was. Four days later, God created the sun, the moon, the stars of heaven. Four days later. So what's this light be over here on the first day? What is that? It's a lot. <laughs> One thing it is, light is measured in wavelengths, waves. Okay? Different lights emit different wavelengths. What else is measured in wavelengths? Sound. Sound. Light and sound are basically the same in the spirit. That's why you see light coming out of beings in the spirit as they're making a sound. They speak. Sound comes out, light comes out. We're called light beings. We're imagers of God. That's part of what that means. We're the image of God. We're radiating that light and the, and the glory of God through that type of thing. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, there's a video online where there's a glass table. Salt is poured all over the table, spread out evenly. There's a frequency generator that's under the table. This frequency generator generates sound, a frequency. So you can hear it. It goes, you know, and you can, you can watch the salt on the table starts kind of vibrating. And then once it hits a particular frequency, all of a sudden the salt shifts and there's a pattern. And you're like, whoa. The frequency continues in intensity and in volume. And what happens is all of a sudden that new image starts shaking and starts beginning to get a little bit disoriented and then it shifts again. Totally new pattern at a totally different frequency. Do you know that the army has sound weapons? Weapons that they can point in a direction and fire. You will not even hear it. It's such a low tone or note, so to speak, so we can understand it, that is emitted long wavelength that it instantly pop knocks people out cold right there on the spot 30 minutes they're out a simple sound it's amazing isn't it now we all remember this story of the guy named uh, Jehoshaphat Took me a while to learn how to pronounce that guy's name, you know. <clears throat> it's like you got to pray in tongues for five minutes to, to say it over and over and over again. We all know the story, so I'll jump to the end. The strange thing happens. The praisers and the worshipers are the ones that are tapped to go out and lead the army. I mean, you talk about doing a tilt to Western thought. That is just absolute stupidity for a war tactic. It makes no sense to anybody. But God did it anyway. The praisers and worshipers join together, and God gives them the song that they need to sing. Follow me. The song that they need to sing, the declaration that they need to make, in order for God to be able to accomplish his purpose when they get to where it is that God wants to take them. So they start, praise the Lord, his mercy endures forever. This is how we do it in church, you know. Praise the Lord, his mercy endures forever. These people had to walk seven miles. Seven miles saying the same thing over and over and over again. 
So what happens? They get to the end. These are people that are used to working together, flowing together with one another. They're marching in a cadence together. It's creating a sound in the earth. How do you think the walls of Jericho fell down? I got loosened up enough to fall down. March together, sound going out through the earth. We're not talk, talking about a few 25 or 30 people. We're talking about thousands of people doing this. They're all saying the same thing over and over and over again. It's like a battering ram in the spirit that just kind of keeps going like this the whole time. And you know good and well, in their heart, they're probably freaking out. Because this is the first time anything like this has ever been done. And they're like, geez, they're like, God, if you don't come through. Which is exactly where God wants to have us. Most of the time. So that we'll get over ourselves and just do it, no matter how stupid or crazy it looks, you know. So they kept on, kept on, kept on. By the time they got to their designated place where the enemy was all set up to go to war against them, they were released in such a precise cadence of sound, perfected by the presence of God in them giving him glory. Because like the Bible says, God enthrones himself where? On the praises of his people. So God's sitting as the throne, on the throne, on these people as they're walking and marching through the land. And they get to that place, what happens? We all know. The enemy is confused. The army doesn't have to do anything. But go collect all of the stuff that they had left over. Because God confused the enemy and they just killed themselves. Sound. From the throne. The tabernacle of David. The saints. The Old Testament saints. Participating. Simply doing what it is that God told them to do. Look, we get, I've been doing this church thing for a long time. And I see it, I, I see it in myself. You know, we get on the fourth time through a course of a song, and you're kind of like, you know, can we be done with this already? <laughs> you know, we, we need something fresh and something new. We need a new groove, a new beat. You know, no. You know, this, this is where you have to, you have to trust we can trust this man. I'm telling you, we can trust this man. He's a warrior par excellence. I'm telling you. And when we get in that vein like that, there's a reason for it. And we may have to stay there. I was in a prayer meeting one time with another guy. It was just two guitars. And we were playing. We played for almost two hours the same song. Now, I came to the meeting with a list of songs. I had it all mapped out. They practiced. I was ready to rock and roll and go. God kept us on, two, on one song. One song the whole time. Two hours. And my fingers didn't fall off. It was a miracle. <laughs> and God accomplished what it was that he wanted to do during that time. I um, was speaking at a conference in the Philippines years and years ago. There was an mission, American missionary that was there, <clears throat> and he um, gave a testimony. He was doing a crusade, an open-air crusade. There were thousands of people that were there. It was in the Philippines. It's during monsoon season. Uh, if you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about. And he could see behind... All of the people w w that he was speaking to, a dark black horizon that was coming his direction. And as it continued to get closer, he could actually see the wall of rain that was coming down. And of course, under his breath, he's trying to preach and, you know, remain normal. And he's, you know, asking the Lord, Lord, what are we going to do here? I mean, this rain's going to run everybody off. It's going to drench everybody and all of our equipment, you know, all this kind of thing. And the Lord gave him a plan. And he said, do this. Stop. Gather the people together. And he said, clap, what I, clap in the way I show you. So he started clapping. And he led all the people in it. 
follow me, do this. And they just started in a rhythm. And as they kept going, it just got faster and faster and faster. And the rain's still coming. And it got faster and faster, and then it just erupted in praise. He looks up, the rain's still coming. And I heard him give this testimony himself at, at a conference. So he said, okay, we did it again. The third time, they had to do it three times. And he was trying to keep everybody occupied. He didn't want anybody to see what was coming. But he could see what was coming. And on the third time, the people erupted in praise. Whew. The wall of rain, he watched it. It split and went down both sides. Pouring rain, lightning, thunder. All the people were so caught up in praise, they didn't even hardly recognize it. And the, it went all the way around. And then behind him, the stage and everything, it joined back together again and kept on going. I mean, this was just 20 or 25 years ago. Now, how is that? He heard a sound. He got everybody united in the sound. It took them their seven miles of time <laughs> to get together with it and get over themselves with it. And all of that, and get to the place to where they were of one heart, one mind together with one another, like on the day of Pentecost. Boom! Then the Spirit of God comes. Split the wall of rain. So, tying it all together. This is what it means for us. This is how we do it. When we join together, the City Gate tribe, Guests included, whoever. <clears throat> when we join together and we have praise and worship, and there's other ways to do it but, but this, but I'm talking about the corporate sense. We join together in praise and worship. We just begin to exalt. We just begin to praise the Lord. And if you're sensitive in the spirit, what's happening is um, the presence of God is, is increasing as we wander about in the flow. And I'll speak from having led praise and worship myself. Sometimes you're wandering around, you're trying to find that thing. You know, you're trying to find that flow so you can help lead everybody into it. We're a warring company. We're not just here to just sing happy, clappy songs all the time. You know, so when we're at war, you got to think we're at war. So we're wandering around. You got to cut the music group some slack sometimes and, you know, let them find that place, whatever it is. We got into it. We hit it this morning two or three times. We got into it. And so, and you know it, you have to discern it by the Spirit. And that's when God needs you, every one of us, to take our position. Get on the throne and realize that He's using you, He's using your sound. You may not be the one that's up front on the microphone making the declarations and the decrees when the Spirit of God says, okay, stretch forth your strong scepter and now rule. And the decrees and the declarations are released. And it may be a new song. And it may just be an instrument playing. Because the instruments can prophesy. It may be the reality of it is that you're back in the back corner over there. You're just dancing up a storm. You know, and just praising God. And the reality of it is, is we may be carrying on all kind of business up here. And the truth is, God is using you. You're the one that's bringing the breakthrough. Because it's all supported by everything that everybody else is doing. So it's not about what happens up here. It's about what's going on out here. In the atmosphere. In the spirit. When we're called together as a warring company for particular type times like that, we need to get comfortable. Now I can assure you, if you've never been up front on a microphone in an atmosphere like that and been used by God to issue a decree... That's pretty intimidating. 
I'm just telling you, I've been there. It's pretty intimidating. But you can grow into it. And God can teach you, and you can start in your home, and you can start in your neighborhood, and it just continues to grow and grow and increase and increase. And you may not ever be one that takes the front, takes the microphone, all of that kind of thing. Sometimes too much of that gets to be too American for me, quite frankly. You need to submit yourself to the place so that God can use the giftings in you, the anointings in you, the presence of the Spirit in you, in such a measure that you can contribute. The church builds itself up by what every joint supplies. The reality of it is, even when I'm, I'm preaching, even when we're on the music team together, whatever we're doing, we need you to find your sound for that time. We need you to release the sound for that time. And that sound may just be clapping. It may just be moving around. You make sound when you move around, whether you realize it or not. You might not hear it, but the Bible says all of creation is crying out to the glory of God. How are they, do, how are they doing that? Well, the trees do what they're supposed to do. They sway in the wind. That's how they're proclaiming the glory of God. Because they're performing and doing. Performing is a bad word. Uh, they are just doing and being what it is that God's created them to be. For the moment. To contribute to what happens in the whole. Everything that goes on in our gatherings together is some element of warfare. Children's church. Us coming here, us leaving, still in the midst of it, God wants all of us to find a place of comfort in being who he created us to be, releasing our sound when it is that we sense especially that he is enthroned on our praises. Just bow your heads for a moment right there where we are. Lord, this is a, it's an amazing thing to me. That you're actually able to use us to do all of this. But we say amen to it. So be it. You've chosen to use us. We're all sons of yours. Sons of the living God. We have all been granted the divine right to rule and reign in this life as kings. We're all here to team together with King Jesus to displace all of the enemy on the planet in order to see the planet return to its original purpose and all the people therein. Father, open up our eyes to see it in greater measure. Grant us the revelation that can only come by your Spirit. Father, I ask you to break off any fear or intimidation that anyone may have in walking in who they are as the sound of the Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. So stand together if you would, please. Don't you need to make the... That was a 
overwhelmingly exactly what we needed to hear. Because tonight is the first night of our Glory Net meeting at 5 o'clock. And just because I'm giving announcements, don't get into your analytical brain. I want you to stay right where the Spirit took us. Because this is all part of becoming that sharp, threshing instrument to do the bidding of the Lord in this city, out of this house. So tonight we are, we are meeting at 5 o'clock to worship. And where we were starting tonight was the story of Jehoshaphat. <laughs> so we're going to begin there. And we're going to worship. We're going to worship tonight. Bring your praise, bring your adoration. Because we are going to enter into the cadence of the Lord that he's calling us to enter into so the atmosphere in this region can be broken. And we are going to take our seat comfortably for who he has told us we are, and we are going to execute out of that place where God is leading us into. So come tonight at 5. We'll be doing this for the next several weeks on Sunday night because we... Had when Chuck Pierce was here in 2019, he said there was a spider web across the state. And the Lord gave Apostle Jackie a vision of the glory net where all over the state, we are having meetings of just worship over this state to counter and to burn up and to lay the worship of the Most High God over anything the enemy wants to do or has done or even think he can do because he rules and reigns in this state. He is going to be glorified through this house to bring that about. Where the enemy comes in to steal, kill, and destroy, we all know that. But we also know that Father God has deep he has deep roots in this state that have yet to come to its fullness so we can become the glory state so that the governmental gate state over this state in the spirit realm will be ruled and reigned by him and his ecclesia. Now this ecclesia joins lots of other ecclesias across this state in, in the glory net. You can even have a glory net on your street. If you want to have a walking worship with your phone, you can do that. You can get your neighbor. Or you can call somebody here and say, hey, come walk my neighborhood. Come walk in front of my city hall with me. We're going to glorify the king of kings over our state so that the evil one has no authority to move, to legislate, to have illegal people be voted into office that stand against the Most High God. We have to do this. This is our assignment. So come tonight, even though it may be, it, you know, all of what was said today was so deep and revelatory. Thank you, Bradley. Yes. It's exactly what we needed in order to begin to execute this. When, when we are standing in a place that we do not know what to do, and in a place in my life, the Lord said to me, Oh, your obedience will grant you sight. You got no, you got no sight right now. <laughs> you obey me. Sight's coming. And that's exactly what you said when, when David and his men were in the tabernacle. Sight came. Sight will come to us. The next step, the next declaration, the next war piece, the next wherever we're headed to break open this state it is coming It, I am believing with everything in me it is coming we are in obedience therefore sight comes so we start that tonight um, don't forget the October 21st hub with Isaac Petrie he will be here on Friday on that Friday night October 16th 
I mean October 21st. I need to read the thing right. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. October 21st. Then um, Chuck Pierce will be here on November 4th. If you are coming, you need to register. We are going to have a very full house. There's no fee, but your registration grants you a seat. And so you will have to go through the line to get checked in so you can have a seat because we are going to have a full house. Uh, don't forget Tuesday nights, our Advancing Faith meets. And I just want, I just want you to to worship as we go. If you haven't given your tithes and offerings today, please do so. Uh, I just want Nathaniel to... S There's a settling of this sermon. I mean, there really is a settling on our spirit man. And there's an awakening in our soul to say, yes, Lord. And to fall into the line, into the cadence that God has into this house. Whether you're a shareholder, whether you're a visitor. Whether you're watching online and you want to enter in. There's a cadence that we're going to enter into to do the bidding of the Lord. So I bless you to go. I bless you just to stay in worship for a minute. This was the word of the Lord. Go home, re-listen, ask your place as for your cadence ask and hear the word of the lord and obey it because he is faithful to do what he has determined to do and in this house we are going to be faithful to join him so i bless you thank you bradley i bless you i just that word was the word for today so we love you bradley thank you